Hi there, my name is Anthony Chung. I'm the head of market analysis here at Amplified Trading. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel to get daily content from myself and the rest of the team. And if there's any questions about today's briefing, feel free to leave a comment below. Okay, good, good morning, folks. It is Thursday, the 12th of November. I hope you are doing well. I'm uh, gonna have a quick look around the markets. And rather than really focus so much on the charts, uh, in this briefing, I really want to get you up to speed on the COVID situation, particularly in the US, uh, and also a few things to think about uh, in order to kind of anticipate what might happen in the coming weeks, and also to put a little bit of context as to the moves we've seen this week, of course, uh, kicking off with that virus um, vaccine information coming out of Pfizer, of course. So just having a look at the charts uh, this morning, let's start in chronological order. Um, on Wall Street last night, this is what the heat map looked like, and a bounce back for the tech stocks. And so the Nasdaq 100 jumped the most, it was up about 2.31%. The S&P comparatively was up just around three quarters of 1%. The Dow was actually flat to minor negative. Um, some of the uh, stay at home shares, which have been pretty battered earlier this week on the back of the Pfizer news put in a, a pretty decent recovery. So likes of Amazon, Apple and the mega cap names uh, up around 3 to 3.4%. 3 um, in terms of Asian equity markets, uh, traded mostly lower, uh, sentiment gradually deteriorating from the somewhat mixed performance we had on the close on Wall Street, as I just mentioned. Um, but I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. There's been a lot of uh, noises about potentially a rotation intercyclicals, as we mentioned before, out of some of these fairly stretched moves we've seen in some of the tech space. Uh, but I'm going to give you reasons to think that now's not the time for that, uh, because I think, in summary, things are going to get worse before they get better. Uh, and I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, but having a look then at the charts and how things are shaping up this morning, uh, equity index futures uh, are trading negative. Um, you can see here the Dow uh, just finding some technical resist resistance at around its S1, which is quite a nice area now of resistance for the price activity before the US comes in, that could well cap the upside here, um, which is around that 29,175 area, uh, which was around the support point that we saw before the bounce that came into the close on Wall Street. Uh, elsewhere, the NASDAQ down around 55, the S&P kind of locked within a bit of a trading range from uh, the session from, from yesterday morning. Uh, defined by a high of around 74 and a quarter to a low of 40 and a quarter. Uh, so we're around the bottom end of that range for the moment. Uh, elsewhere, gold uh, it up, is up $4, but relatively flat. Uh, the dollar is largely unchanged, albeit has been moving higher in the Asia Pacific session, which has weighed on the major pairs um, to a certain degree. Underperformance, though, being observed in sterling currency, uh, as you can see here, uh, finding uh, a nice area of again resistance from the support levels from yesterday afternoon uh, it's come back up to retest before pushing back down now to the s1 which brings into play around 131.70 uh, just above is the s1 and then the low that we had before the rally we saw on uh, would have been tuesday morning um, we have had some uk data already out this morning and for q3 preliminary gdp it came in quarter and quarter at 15.5%, that is softer than expected 15.8. Other numbers that came in, things like manufacturing output was 0.2% against an expected 1%. So um, although this data I think is largely insignificant because the market is now forward looking given the new COVID situation developing right now and the current then restrictions in place which will impede Q4 growth, the fact that Q3 was a little bit softer um, already and we're expecting further deterioration going forward until the end of the year in the Q4 GDP readings, perhaps then a little bit of a negative headwind just to uh, weigh on sterling. Obviously, some you know, the Brexit deadline is going to be missed, as we heard yesterday, and also the dollar has seen a degree of strength in the overnight Asia-Pacific session. So interesting to keep an eye on that pair this morning. Um, otherwise, oil, uh, most notably for oil, um, it's just held on to the gains from yesterday. We're right at that uh, coloured Kind of rectangle which was the restricting the price uh, over a two-month period really through September and October. We broke through that yesterday uh, just giving some of the renewed kind of pickup in demand expectations albeit I'm probably going to dampen those a little bit by the time I finish this briefing. Um, also we had the drawdown in the APIs remember because of the federal holiday we had in the states 
yesterday for Veterans Day, it means that then um, that data from the DOE is going to come out this afternoon. Uh, and our expectation there is for a drawdown following the uh, American Petroleum Institute figures we had um, two days ago. All right, so going to delve straight in at the deep end. And I'm going to start with this chart. And I'm going to, I'm going to give you my latest take on what I think about COVID and how I think it's going to impact markets and be perceived um, by market participants in the coming weeks. Uh, and starting off with this graphic, this is new reported cases uh, by day in the United States of America. Uh, current US daily record is now over 145,000 um, and hospitalizations, as we can see here, uh, have jumped more than 10% between November 6th to yesterday in six states and led by a 20.4% jump in New Jersey that we've seen. Overall, what has this led to then with this renewed kind of surge in cases in the US? Uh, New York Governor Cuomo came out last night and said that private indoor and outdoor gatherings statewide will be limited to 10 people and that gyms, bars and restaurants must close daily at 10 p.m. These new enforced restrictions will come into effect on Friday. Now, a few things here to be aware of then. Uh, infectious disease experts have warned yesterday that the surge in coronavirus cases in many parts of the US is likely to get materially worse in the coming weeks. Now, I saw a fantastic thread um, uh, by a fairly well-followed scientist, um, which I'm, I'm going to touch upon in a moment. You can see the entire thread on my, my Twitter account. In fact, I'll show you now. So if you just go on my Twitter account, uh, I reshared it. The chap's called Trevor Bedford. And he works for Fred Hutch, which uh, essentially is an organization that looks at studying various different um, uh, viruses, everything from cancer to HIV uh, and ways and means to try and counteract that in, in terms of medical science. Uh, but he had a really good string uh, of tweets that I think needs to be understood. Uh, and basically the point that he was trying to make was that deaths... So this is the case numbers surging, of course, from what we've seen in America. But the death numbers are relatively low comparative to wave one, of course, that we saw back in. The peak really came around the 17th, 16th of April. That was when numbers were just over 2,200. Uh, we currently are uh, around numbers of around 1,400 as of yesterday uh, in the US. So around half, let's say. But important things to recognize here is that deaths are a lagging indicator and bas basically this chaps run the maths and you can approximate that there is a, a, a timeline of around a three week lag reported so um, deaths lag reported cases there is a lag between when a case is diagnosed and when the individual may succumb to their disease and there is a further lag between the date of death and the date of which then the death is reported. Hence then, consequently, there's a three-month lag. Um, now, doing the relevant adjustments to calculate then predicted rates, it is anticipated that with around, let's say, 118,000 reported cases, we've even gone above that now by a good 25,000, but at that figure, when these numbers were run, in the US, with a seven-day smoothing out of the averages, it would translate to approximately... 2,150 deaths um, being reported in 22, day, 22 days time. So basically the beginning of September, or beginning of December, excuse me. Um, so what we're saying is that this graphic here now would approximate that this, this acceleration, which you can quite clearly see that the rolling average here is getting more steeper in terms of its trajectory, that that is going to end up looking and if anything, going in excess of the peak of what we saw in April. We're just right at the bottom of it at the moment. And that's what because of the three week lag with this, this graphic here. Now, a couple of things to be aware of as well is that even if a vaccine is approved soon, and obviously this has been the main focal point of markets this week, everyone's kind of latched on. Uh, and I think a strong degree of that is behavioral of people's want of course, to address the humanitarian crisis that we're currently facing on the global level. Um, but even if a vaccine is approved soon, 
people must continue to rely on face masks, social distancing for a number of months as a minimum, most likely, because initial vaccine supplies will be limited, of course, we know this, and will be reserved for healthcare workers and other frontline workers and demographics such as the old elder, uh, nursing home carers, things like this. That means then that the more kind of productive, let's call them members of a society that create then economic growth, uh, they're going to be pretty much last in the queue because predominantly a lot of these are going to be of, of the age that would not be on the priority order. Uh, meaning then that more widespread inoculation is going to take time. So not only are there these barriers we've discussed before about uh, logistical, you know, the two-shot process, like what we had with Pfizer, it's got to come a month later, once it, it's got to be transported in ultra-cold temperatures, which brings about infrastructure issues with uh, costs, so on and so forth. The other point then being is that by the time we see full inoculation, it's going to be a long period ahead. It isn't, as I would say, what politicians are suggesting, like in the UK right now, that, yep, Christmas is sorted, don't worry, guys, the Pfizer have got the vaccine. We'll get it out there in December. Far from the case that that will address the current situation, in my humble opinion. Um, this leads me then to think, generally, that the market has inappropriately reacted so far this week to the latest Pfizer vaccine news, particularly the initial knee-jerk moves that we're seeing. Um, and I think that they're going to revert back to ha having a more pessimistic view about this current situation. Um, now, a couple of things here. Um, the US is going to be behind the curve. It already is. Um, I mean, one of the things that you're seeing here at the moment is that quite the opposite is happening in mainland Europe. In fact, numbers in France, Germany, and one of the hardest hit areas, Belgium, their numbers of cases have started to plateau. Uh, irrespective of the fact that things are spiking, obviously deaths are rising, as are hospitalizations. Because remember, it's a forward indicator, the fact that cases are plateauing, so we can't anticipate those deaths to start also doing the same for a number of weeks. The point is, though, we're hitting a plateau on this exact graphic we're here, we're looking in the US. Uh, and so that's come because of proactive and preemptive measures that were taken, and fairly stringently so in the cases of France, for example. So even though the cases have been bad, they've been dealing with it in a fairly prompt fashion. Quite the opposite is happening in America, of course because you've almost had a political distraction, which is a US election, of which the current administration, may I remind you, Trump, has made zero mention of this because he's still trying to legally challenge an election which he's quite clearly lost. So for me, again, uh, a lack of leadership and interest in an outgoing Trump administration with very little political gain to be confronting this issue, which is if anything, only going to stain his reputation as president now he knows he's going to be leaving, um, means then that there's going to be a lukewarm response to really tackling this as it should be done scientifically. Um, because we know that, well, if there were no politics in human society, we probably would be taking a radically different approach to this. But that's not the case. Uh, and obviously politics is right right in there in terms of how these countries are responding with this. And I think in the US, it's going to be, they're going to be distinctly behind the curve. And my worry is, is that these numbers here we're looking at already currently going to mean that the death rate is going to, if anything, exceed phase one. But I think that that number could have the potential to go way higher than phase one. Now, just looking at the country on a, on a nationwide map, you can see the spread is already happening. Uh, before, it was really more centered in Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, these types of areas in the Midwest. But we are, we are gradually moving out again. You can see both East and West. And another concern I have here is Thanksgiving is coming, uh, November 26th. So we've only got a couple of weeks. And obviously, this is one of the major holidays in America where people typically travel. They move around. They mix with family members and friends. So the potential for further transmission of this virus without any appropriate, more stringent measures being imparted, uh, I think it's going to be difficult. So a lack of national leadership, I think, puts a lot of pressure on, on state governors to really take action. Uh, and so, uh, again, you're probably starting to come to the uh, realisation that I'm, I'm quite bearish on, on what this means. From a... From a 
market's point of view then, uh, I think it's way too early to talk about this whole rotation out of tech uh, and the kind of end of what has been a pretty phenomenal run for a lot of these pandemic related individual equity stories. Um, because what I'm saying is I think things are going to get worse, particularly in America. And so I think that that's still got some legs to run in the likes, particularly of you know, companies like Amazon, which have obviously thrived in this type of you know, environment. Um, so, you know, COVID cases get worse, restrictions get tightened, inevitably lockdowns take place. Um, and I would not be surprised in America if this gets rolled out all the way through into next year. And then Biden comes in and obviously he's talked about his willingness to do further lockdowns. So I think you're good for the moment in terms of some of these tech names. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a little bit preemptive um, to start talking about then a full born kind of rotation out of that. I don't think that's going to be a case at least for another three to six months. Uh, the former being the earliest possible, uh, I would say, in, in my opinion. So, yeah, sorry to be the uh, the bearer of bad news, but I kind of feel compelled here to, to really dish out a dose of reality when everyone's, I feel, has got a little bit ahead of themselves on the vaccine front this week. Now, it's not all doom and gloom, though. Uh, Anthony Fauci, the, the kind of leading infectious disease expert in the US, he was speaking in a conference yesterday. And he said he was optimistic about a forthcoming update uh, on the virus from biotech firm uh, Moderna. If you remember, these are one of the key companies that's been around from the beginning, from Gilead, Astra with Oxford University, Moderna, Pfizer and BioNTech. These are all the big uh, runners, if you like, for the vaccine uh, in clinical uh, phase three trials. Now, he said he would be surprised if we didn't see a similar degree of basically efficiency of the vaccine to positive results comparative to that of Pfizer. Uh, and the reason why people are talking about this is that Moderna are due for an update in the coming days. So it is something to look, look out for. But as much as that will be a good thing, um, you know, on the surface, more companies getting to the point of where uh, the science is proving more effective is definitely a good thing. However, I do think that in terms of market's response, um, it is going to be diminishing, as in I think the first cat out of the bag was slightly caught markets off guard when Pfizer just broke the news. I think as more companies come out and say similar, I think it's going to have a lesser degree of impact in the day trading environment because of the factors I was talking about before uh, and we have done throughout the week about the whole timeline to um, distribution, inoculation, as well as things in the context of getting getting worse at this point in time. Uh, the silver lining, of course, and this is what's helped, actually, uh, companies like Pfizer and Moderna, is that um, with all these case numbers accelerating, it means that these scientists can, can gather more data and quicker. And so, therefore, hopefully they can achieve their end result uh, in a more timely fashion, we hope. Touch wood. So, yeah. Um, that's it really and uh, i think really more i wanted to say on that but that really was i feel quite strongly on this at the moment um uh, we shall see but i'm just getting you prepared 12th of november you heard it here um this is going to get quite bad in the states coming forward and, uh, and i'm afraid christmas could well be cancelled at this rate all right let's have a look elsewhere um opec yeah, it's been a couple of reports out of OPEC overnight, and obviously a lot of people talking about this. Uh, price has recovered quite sharply throughout the course of, of this week. I mean, we were just two weeks ago trading near $30 a barrel, and we are now trading up at 41 and a half. So sharp recovery, um, and this has put a lot of emphasis then on, do now OPEC Plus actually need to do anything uh, they've already really committed themselves to roll over, but for how long is the kind of question. And this is the latest. Talks between OPEC and its allies are zeroing in on a delay to next year's planned oil output increase of three to six months, according to several delegates in a Bloomberg article from last night. Uh, the ministers are holding their online meeting at the end of the month, November 30th to December 1st. So I don't think there's really too much to add there. As I said, in the oil market short term, um, definitely this COVID situation would not fare well for oil demand expectations, which have been reignited earlier in this week. 
Uh, if things play out, as I've mentioned, on the COVID side in America, it could well be then the oil price does start to give back and drift down again uh, over the foreseeable weeks uh, to two month period. Um, so yeah, that that's it on the, the OPEC side. The other thing was Brexit. We obviously had the headlines yesterday. Uh, we saw reports um, that Ireland sees the EU UK trade talks going past the mid November deadline. Of course, that was for this Sunday. Uh, this fits exactly with our baseline expectations we've been talking about uh, on the desk for a, for a while. We never thought they were going to strike a deal this week, not with the more kind of tangible uh, and legal, real hard deadlines coming uh, until we get well into December. So with a little bit of volatility yesterday uh, on that comment, but I just want people to be super careful with not getting overly committed to that type of news flow in the context. I really don't think it was that uh, surprising. So after it kind of blipped high, it blipped down, and then it kind of came back up, and now it's started drifting down, but I think that's largely for, for other reasons uh, as well. So, yeah, a couple of things to, to be aware of. We could see further Brexit headlines before the end of the week. I'm sure that we will. Uh, just given that kind of tentative deadline that was in place at the end of the week, I'm sure uh, the risk for me is more about um, going into the end of the week. There was supposed to be a deadline. Strategically, if I was... Dominic Cummings, I'd be very much putting the pressure on Boris to be quite stern, threaten to walk away that whole kind of pantomime saga to kick off once again, just to keep the pressure on uh, at this point in time. This irrespective of the fact that obviously in the UK, the COVID situation is particularly challenging uh, at this present point in time. Um, okay, quick look at the calendar for today. Uh, what have we got? Um, we've already had the UK data, as I mentioned. We are going to get the IEA oil market report later, following off the OPEC one we had yesterday. Um, Eurozone industrial production at 10. US CPI and weekly jobless claims coming at 1.30. I don't really see either of them being too important, quite honestly, um, particularly on the inflationary side. There's no real pressures at present, given the economic environment and obviously with the adoption of AIT, we're nowhere near it becoming a real focal point for Fed policy at this point. We're definitely downside risks emerging uh, ever more so. And then we've got the DOEs uh, as per normal holiday uh, impacted data coming out a day later. It's going to be at the slightly later time of four o'clock uh, London, not 3.30. Speakers, though, there's, there's a few you do need to be aware of. Um, Bank of England's Bailey, uh, the governor, does speak and he's already started speaking. In fact, he's just said that sterling data was in line with the bank's expectations. Recovery has been strong, but we still have a huge gap and the process has been very uneven. I don't think it's really too surprising, uh, to be honest. Nothing really interesting out of that, but he is speaking at the moment. Um, you've got ECB's De Guindos, Fed's Evans, Fed's Williams, and Bank of Canada's Wilkins all speaking today. And it's the second day of two of the ECB Forum, uh, Centra, Portugal. Um, and Panetta, Mersch, Schnabel, and Lagarde probably the main one here to be aware of, and I'll be sharing the live links at the time, is at 4.45, Christine Lagarde, Bank of England Governor Bailey, Fed Chair Powell, they're speaking on central banking collectively on a panel discussion from 4.45. Uh, so that's definitely one late in the day to, to be aware of that could be interesting. I'm not, I'm not expecting as a base expectation anything really to be said. I think they've already shown their hand in recent commentary and bank decisions that have only been a short time period ago. But of course, these are the main players in the mix. And so uh, any further insight as towards becoming uh, perhaps even more uh, downbeat uh, would be quite interesting. Uh, all right, that is it. I'm gonna leave the, the briefing at that. Uh, I have noticed that the dollar's taking a bit of a turn as I'm coming to the end of the briefing. So it's given up any of those overnight initial European entrance gains. Uh, and just backing off in a Dixie a touch, which is just providing a bit of a bid tone um, here into uh, some of the other currencies.